Hey, Geekscapists, welcome to a brand new Geekscape podcast. I'm Jonathan London, your host. And if this is your first Geekscape, this is the part of the show where I say, where have you been these last 15, 16 years? Uh, I've kind of lost count. I have to like mathematically peel back. Okay, well, it's 2023. We started Geekscape in late 2006. Okay, we're getting close to 18 years old. Uh, it's insane, but we've been talking movies, video games, comic books, pop culture. Sometimes we're at a con. Sometimes this is done live on stage. Sometimes it's a panel that I'm moderating, and I take it, and I put it up on this feed. Uh, what did y'all get? Y'all got some weird stuff in the feed recently if you're subscribing on audio. Uh, I really, really, really enjoyed Blue Beetle, and I loved that Blue Beetle episode. I love that movie. I think it's fun. If you guys are into comic book movies, you haven't had the comic book exhaustion. Maybe if you have, that's the movie that feels fresh again. So I'm going to recommend Blue Beetle. Uh, did you partake in this last uh, weekend's $4 movie Sunday thing? Uh, there were $4 movies this past Sunday, and there are people who I know went like three or four movies. They had a 3D uh, re-release of Jurassic Park. A lot of my friends went to see that. I suggested friends with kids to go see that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, which I loved, or Blue Beetle, which I thought was great if the kids were a little bit older. Uh, I went and saw, I caught up on Mission Impossible. I caught up on the new Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, because you got to see those movies on the big screen. They're spectacles. They've got crazy set pieces, and this one's no different. I don't know. Yeah, Christopher McQuarrie is probably like, yeah, then we'll do this, then we'll do that, and yeah, screw it. And then he'll jump off a, a cliff and how many ways can you jump off a cliff? Uh, so we wouldn't enjoy that one yesterday. Uh, so I don't know. Hit the comments. Maybe you're watching this live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, or uh, maybe on LinkedIn. That's weird. We, we stream to LinkedIn. So if you're dropping resumes, drop some comments. Um, and uh, we've got a great show, Talking Movies. There's going to be a lot of movie talk today. My, my friend Adam Siegel is on the show. He's got a brand new movie coming out this week called Nandor Fordor and the Talking Mongoose. Speaking of panels and, and moderating and all that stuff I like to do on stage, uh, I actually met Adam at LA Comic Con. I think it might have been two LA Comic Cons ago. So it would have been the engagement LA Comic Con when I proposed to Heidi. You guys remember that. Uh, Giancarlo Esposito was my wingman for the proposal, held the ring, gave me the ring, and then I proposed to Heidi. Uh, well, in the wings was my friend Claire King. And Claire, I know, this is getting circuitous, sorry. Claire, I know from longtime Geekscapist David King, who listened all the way back in the Geek Drum days, and ended up married to Claire. And I remember in 2009, being in London uh, for a music video and going to lunch with David, and David saying, yeah, this, this girl and I, uh, it's getting serious, and... This and that. I think that already moved continents because one of them is Australian, I think. <laughs> Maybe that was David. Uh, but he was in London. And um, and now Claire is one of the producers over at Legion M, friends of ours and our neighbors over at Comic-Con. And they're putting out Alexander's Philippe, Alexander Philippe's movie. Uh, they're putting out my friend Adam Mortimer's movies, our friend Kevin Smith's movies. And this guy coming up, Adam Sigal, he's got this brand new movie, Nander Fordor and the Talking Mongoose. It's uh, Claire produced it. It's Legion M. And it's uh, starring our former Geekscape friend. He's still our friend, but he was former Geekscapist, uh, Simon Pegg. And uh, Adam's on the show. We, we met backstage, I think, at LA Comic Con. And he's like, yeah, I'll come on the show. And here he is. He's coming on the show. Um, so that's what we got coming up. There's going to be a lot of filmmaking talk. I want you guys to strap yourselves in for that. Um, and let's just not dilly dally. Here we go. All right, Geeks Gabus, we're back. First question, now that we're live, is the pronunciation of my guest's name. I said, listen, there's Peter Seagull, there's Steven Seagal, 
and then there's the word sigil, right? Like a like a sign, like a like an emblem, like an insignia, the sigil. Um, but Adam spells it S I G A L. Now there's a tier system. I think maybe like an F Mary Kill as far as pronunciations for his last name. The options are sigil, sigil, or st- like <laughs> Steven Seagal. <laughs> so go, go ahead and F Mary Kill amongst yourselves. What? spelling or pronunciation you would want but let's go ahead to the source right now filmmaker peter i can't even say it with a straight face now uh he's gonna have to say it himself um peter's here or adam i was i got busy saying peter siegel um adam you're you're on the show uh which how do you pronounce your last name because i said it siegel in the only because it wasn't spelled like siegel or seagal but i said siegel is that correct they're all right and they're all wrong. I don't actually. No, don't do this. This okay. quantum physics shit. Well, here's what I'll tell you: one that is wrong. So my dad's name is Stephen. So we skip the Seagal because my okay. dad's name is Stephen. So we don't want to necessarily do the Seagal. You don't want to pick up the mantle again. When I tell people, I just say Siegel. That's okay. it. Just Siegel. Because okay. Peter Siegel's cool. Peter Siegel's great. Fucking great. Um, and Siegel is like I think it adds to your mystery. I always thought that word was pronounced sigil, so I'm. It, I is, don't. it is. It's sigil. So I'm going to call you Adam Sigil from now on. You can call me Adam Sigil. I'm actually yeah. going to legally change it to that. It is sigil, and I remember that now because this is the nerdiest. This may be the nerdiest thing that's been said on this show in the, la- in the last in the last week. Um, Geekscape is remember in the late '90s when there were uh, a lot of problems with distribution in comic books, and Marvel and DC were having issues, and all of a sudden, like like. Uh, there were like three or four distributors and nobody in obviously image comics popped out of nowhere in 1992, 93 and started uh, their own line of comics. And other people were like, Hey, I'm going to jump myself in the uh, indie comics ring. Remember cross gen comics. <laughs> they had a comic called sigil. In fact, their entire shared comic universe over at cross gen was based around in each comic series. There was a character with a sigil and it was like, the emblem of the comic book company that That's was in the upper left hand corner of the comic so the sigil was the big one and that is why i should have always remembered how to pronounce the process of elimination then sigil is just an incorrect pronunciation of just throw that away seagull doesn't well, work it doesn't work because my dad so it's adam siegel oh. don't you want to blaze your own path absolutely <laughs> i'm changing my last name to sigil <laughs> It's single, it's single now because this fucking yeah. dope over here on Geekscape couldn't say it right. It's a new era for me. I love that the Geekscape is, if you're not driving off the street, Geekscape is listening to this in your car or like throwing your computer at work, listening to this at work. Uh, I'm sorry for that that literacy issue that happened earlier today. I'm, like, whoa. I'm, I'm currently streaming this from LinkedIn because you know me as, as I update my resume since the movie industry. I laugh about that stuff and then every now and then we get a comment from uh, LinkedIn. Uh, Jim Pagranelli from Lo- uh, Long Island, he's here or he's not Long Island, he's in, he's in uh, Brooklyn. Where are you? He's, you're in Brooklyn, Jim. As someone used to uh, used to the other people flailing with pronunciation of my last name, this intro gave me a nice chuckle. I, I actually literally had my one of my ex girlfriends, really good friends. Last name was Pellegrinelli, so I'm assuming that's how you pronounce his last name. Yeah, it's Jim. Who struggled with your last name, Jim? Uh, whatever. You're not being interviewed, Jim. But you, Mr. <laughs> Pellegrinelli, uh, I miss you, buddy. And uh, Jim and I, you're here every week, man. I love having you in the in the audience, Jim. Thanks. Mm-hmm. So, Adam, um, you got this new movie, Nandor Fordor in the Talking Mongoose. You're you're hyped, dude. <laughs> I'm hyped. I am. Talk to me about putting this movie together because you basically had to put it together on the like, like basically on the tail end of the last movie, um, and this one is completely different. Like I watched this uh, trailer and I'm like, okay, this isn't Chariot. It is different. I mean, all my movies seem to be about death, so it does have at least that through line. But yeah, I mean, look, I can give you the short sort of broad strokes, or I can give you the gnarly, like, in-depth way that this one came about. <laughs> I mean, whichever is better for this show. And I'm uh, allowed to curse on this show, too. I should probably ask that up front. Yeah, but what? Am I allowed you, to curse yeah, on Yeah, you, you heard my intro. Um, you can also mispronounce things that are that a third grader could say yes. properly. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
I talk mean, to me about how this movie came about in like broad strokes. Did you write that? You write all your stuff. I write all my stuff. I wrote this. I heard this true story, you know, like 10 years ago. And I always knew I was going to make my talking mongoose movie. I would always tell people I'm going to make it. And it wasn't until I had this really gnarly, bizarre religious life experience that it like suddenly all came together. So I wrote, I actually wrote this script while I was making Chariot, if you can believe it, which is fucking insane. Well, Chariot seems like a million spinning plates to begin with like that. It, plus you, that's like pandemic stuff. And I, I mean, in, in, oh, as it, the, the filmmakers who've made, who've come on here to promote the movies they made during the pandemic, they're like, they, they, it was like an experience like none other. And then you wrote something on top of it. Yeah. There's a couple of questions. And the first one I think is, yes, it is based on a true story. Nandor Fordor was a true paranormal investigator. And there was a true story in the Isle of Man that there was a talking mongoose supposedly that was talking to people from a farmhouse. And you and, and Nandor Fordor was the person who was hired to go wow. and and investigate. Yeah, he was, I think, the last person to go investigate. Yeah. Yeah. And then it kind of turned into like a precursor to the National Enquirer to an extent. Like this whole like idea that there was a talking mongoose and a whole village was talking to it under a farmhouse. It, am I incorrect in thinking that no, that was the precursor was, to the National Enquirer? It's a huge story in England. It went all the way to Parliament. It this very this story, and I have to refresh my memory about this. This this actual case led to a fist fight in the halls of Parliament. And it was something to do with like libel and mm -hmm. like, cause, cause the guy, uh, Mr. Irving was very litigious and there was something like, this was a big story back then. And know? they settled to the tune of, I think 7,500 pounds. Which yeah, was a <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this was, yeah. Which was a big settlement. Thing. Yeah. But they probably fought like, like Lucky Charms leprechauns, you know, they, they probably in part, like throwing each other's wigs off and playing. <laughs> <wigs off. laughs> <laughs> that was just British stereotypes. Yeah. Uh, but Sorry. this story, the more I read about this true story, the more insane it, it got. How did you first hear about the Talking Mongo story? Because I knew it's been referenced in pop culture here and there, but not. It, this is a deep cut. So randomly. And it is so random, like it's hilarious. So my job as I was coming up as a filmmaker was I was a private investigator. So I did surveillance on people. I did a lot of sitting in my car, right? And when, you know, this was 10, 12 years ago, so I would listen to the radio a lot, and I would listen to sports talk radio. And I was listening to this show, and they had this ridiculously dumb segment called, like, Dead Guy Birthday. And they would celebrate the birthday of some guy that had been dead. And the guy says, today's the birthday of Dr. Nandor Fodor, the father of modern parapsychology. His most famous case was investigating the talking mongoose of the Isle of Man. And I kind of just was like, what the fuck did he just say? And then I started going online and Googling it, and I was like, holy shit, this is a crazy fucking story. It's so wild. And, and again, back then I was like, I'm going to write about this someday. And I wrote other scripts and I made other, I mean, two movies in the interim of waiting to sort of write this. And then, yeah, I had this weird life experience and it, it led to the, the sort of the synthesis of my own philosophies with the, the biopic of Nandor. So the movie is like, my movie is like, it's probably like 70% based on actual notes and incidents and characters and, you know, like anecdotes and stuff like that from both Nandor and Dr. Price. He, they both wrote about it. Nandor wrote about it most prominently in a book called Between Two Worlds. And then Dr. Price wrote about it in just a bunch of notes. And then some of it is kind of my own suppositions about these characters and in relation to myself. And we, I mean, the liberties are taken. Hmm. Whatever. I don't think they're going to complain. You're definitely not going to get sued or fought in the halls of parliament for this. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just thought this story was insane. But uh, Adam, you had you yourself have an insane story, and I'm skipping a part that I'm actually fascinated about. And I, you, the the private investigator stuff, I think, is so important to your job as a director, and I think yeah. it's very important to your job in the revisionism of your job as a screenwriter you know and like the the best thing i tell people when they're talking about screenwriting is like the first time you meet your characters is like passing them on the street but but then the next day you show up and maybe you find out you you take the same bus and you sit at the bus stop and then the third time you explain exchange highs and then you get to know their name and the time that you're ready to really get them to inhabit your script and, and kind of run with your story is 
they've been longtime friends. And that's kind of familiarity. But that comes through your own personal paleontology of going back in layers. So it's all investigative process, the process of writing, the process of directing, and the process of creating layers of this stuff. Uh, you came to it through private investigating. How did that add to... I don't mean you came to it through private investigating. Uh -huh. you're, you're, no, you're, you're a writer, but how did private investigating and seeing small details... It was, it was that, but it was also just the death of my innocence because I moved to L.A. when I was 19. So I, or, yeah, or, but you moved from Florida, so how innocent were you, dude? But it, well, reasonably, because I was only 20, so I just had no idea sure. what was really out there. So... Well, the, the most primary, the, the biggest influence it had on me was number one, seeing a lot of parts of society that I would never see. I mean, like a, a lot of, a lot of time in, in areas where I didn't spend a lot of time, a lot of people who are not from necessarily the same walk of life as me. And also just seeing people lying and seeing people doing shitty things to each other all day and people who I could walk up to them and I would talk to them and interact with them. And they seemed so nice and so cool. And How did you I, get the job though? I mean, Adam, like you and I have similar stories where we come from a middle class background. We could probably yeah. come from a like, even though I'm Latino, I come from a, a white neighborhood. Like sure. I come from a white neighborhood. And then you move out. I mean, I went to Philly. Instead of coming to LA, you came yeah. you, you came to LA. I went to Philly. Like I did not go into public like private investigation. Why did did you go into private investigation? That's no, what I, I'm asking. No, I, I wanted to. I always wanted to make movies and write. I just needed a job to pay the bills. And my parents knew the owner of this company, and they were like, "Do you want to go be a PI?" And as I started doing it, I was like, "Okay, I get a lot of time to think. I make okay money. I, I get, you know, it, it was a job, sure. and I stuck with it, and I got licensed. And like, I never enjoyed it, but it was better than being a waiter, or better than like a real white collar thing. It had flexibility. It had like, and also, again, like it influences everything, all my writing, like the characters and just like, I can, I feel like I can write truly deep characters now that I've seen what people say they are and then people who they really are having literally seen it in the same mm -hmm. person. So that's the biggest thing that it influenced for me. You could have become Nightcrawler, dude. Uh, I, who says I'm not? <laughs> At night, you're just running around like, well, that Nightcrawler would be X-Men. You know, I'm talking about the movie. And, I know you know, the one you're, I know you're talking the about. Geekscapists don't know. I always have to differentiate things from the X-Men. You know, what's the Wagner? What's his name? Kurt, Kurt Wagner. Kurt, okay. Who I think, somebody asked me, like, who, I mean, don't ask people their, their love language or their sign. Ask people their favorite X-Men. Yeah. And for me, it, it's, it's always been Colossus. I wish it was... Nightcrawler, because I think Nightcrawler is the purest X Men. I think he was the best. He's the friend. He's the one who is. I mean, or that or Kitty Pride, who's also like the most pure, hopeful X Men. Yeah. Doesn't have any bad stories where they do bullshit like beasts. My favorite X Men's really lame, dude. I just my favorite one was Archangel because I just always wanted to be able to fly. <laughs> A lot of X Men can fly. Is that a big <laughs> but, it, but, it, but, but you had to, yeah, yeah, but you had to be like an edge lord. Like you didn't. You weren't Angel. You were yeah. Archangel. Yeah. The, you were yeah, after Apocalypse. The fucked up one. I liked the fucked up one after Apocalypse, like, fucked with him and turned his wings into steel. That I was just, I just thought the visual and it was so dope that I wanted to be like a steel flying angel. I don't think Warren Worthington was that great before no, no. RG. Like, his job on the X Men was basically to pick up X Men and carry them to like yeah. other stuff. Yeah. And like, Gene Gray can do that. Gene Gray can just do sure. that. But like, but he um, yeah, the first toss up with Magneto in the very first X Men movie book, it's like basically he uses Warren Worthington to like throw at the other X Men. Like he's a complete liability. But then when Apocalypse gets a hold of him, then he was dope. Then he was cool. Then he's fucking cool. And I don't think he's been cool. <laughs> No. I have the Age of Apocalypse books amongst the many books on my shelf. The Age of Apocalypse books from the mid nineties. Yeah, and you were around during the the sigil cross gen years. I was around, and I and when you were talking about image too, I've got a bunch of the Max ones over there. The Max was always like my favorite, like sort of undercover. I mean, well, here, hold on. Okay, I mean, Sam Keith's the Max is yeah. an under. I love that Max from TikTok McFarland Toys right there. I know. Oh, dude, I was. I was big, big on those. Obsessed uh, with those. Anyway, I am a big fan of the of Sam Keith's The Max. I think the stuff that Todd McFarlane and I like I like the main image stuff. Like I like all that stuff that Rob Liefeld and Jim Lee and all that, that they were doing. But um, Sam Keith, to me, especially because like he had the indie cred of being on it, he had the cred of like having an MTV cartoon as well. I, the MTV cartoon like, was dope. It was incredible. Sam Keith is somebody who, the second I see any of their artwork on a comic book, 
like whether it's the Max Batman or him just yeah. doing his own indie book, like yeah. he's 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 still working, and I think he's incredible. Mm -hmm. I'll even find his stuff in a mainstream Marvel book from the mm -hmm. '80s, and you know, and I'll do the same thing with um, with what's his name? It does Hellboy? Uh, uh, you know, Magnolia. Mag mm -hmm. like we we talk about Rocket Raccoon. Like Mike Magnolia drew the first Rocket Raccoon story. Crazy of all that stuff or in the Rocket Raccoon title. Yeah, not in the Hulk comic. He was introduced into the Rocket Raccoon title. You can still see that's Mike Magnolia with like yeah. the heavy inks and things like that. And you're just like, oh damn, this is Absolutely. some Mike Magnolia work. All right, let's let's keep talking. You said that there was a religious experience that happened. That yeah, talk it about that thing because you just kind of skipped through it, and I was like, no, 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 no. That feels like a life turning point. That feels like to to get it to without like actually like incriminating people who were involved. The the broad stroke on that is like. Somebody in my life made a decision fully to like devote themselves so wholeheartedly to a religion at the sort of like major detriment to life, mm. like a like a decision to like like a cult. Yeah, exactly. I'm and, saying it. You're not saying it. Like you could yeah, maintain it, relationships, it, yeah, and in a, and in a way that was really fucking gnarly, and and in a way that ruined a a number of lives. And and I remember thinking about it all the time and just being like, how much must you want to believe in something to believe in it so fiercely that you go against the, the daily life and the things that are making you happy on a day-to-day -day basis. And that was what triggered Nandor in a strange way was what Nandor is about is the relationship between faith and cynicism and happiness because Nandor represents myself. And the first conversation I had with Simon was so great because he instantly knew exactly what I was going for. And he felt the same way. And I was like, oh, fuck, yeah, this is it. Basically, like I consider myself to be sort of a spiritual atheist and I don't have any specific religious feeling. I feel like there's more than this, but I don't know what it is. But would that be an agnostic or an atheist? Wouldn't an atheist sort be like that? I feel like the agnostic. And, and I, I'm not great with my terminology, but doesn't agnostic... Neither am I, Mr. Sigal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But basically, I'm, I'm not searching. That's the one thing. Like, I just sure. don't care. Like, I, like I, I think there's more out there, but I don't know what it is. But the point is, the major religions, I just can't vibe with them. Like, I'm with you, and I, but I think that atheism is like a, like a staunch, does not effing exist. And I think no, agnostic no, no. is like... I think agnostic, I think, is closer to what you're saying. You, you could be right. Sure. So I'll call myself an agnostic. But but the point being that the major religions, including the one that this person was a part of, put a lot of stock in things that they wanted you to believe that you couldn't really see and weren't really there. And I could never quite get my brain to that point. I, it, like you sit there, you tell me when you die, you're going to go to heaven and be with all your loved ones for the rest of eternity. It sounds fucking incredible. I'm so stoked for that concept, but there's nothing you can say that's going to give me that deep certainty that that's true. And you've met people with near like death experiences and stuff. And they've told you the stories of like how they saw things. Yeah. I was meeting with a friend yesterday who walked out of a burning house. Like he, he sadly, my friend lost his feet and we went down to the hospital to visit him yesterday. And he walked out of his house and was put in a medically induced coma, but they couldn't believe he walked out of the house. Yeah. He lost his feet in the process, but he said his life when he was on fire flashed before his eyes. And so I was like, did you That's see me? Great. And, was, and I, was I important enough to make the reel of your life? No, I didn't make the reel. He told me. <laughs> he's, like, he's, like, hey, he's like, I didn't see you at any, at any point. My entire life flashed before my eyes. You were not in any of it, Jonathan. He's like, my life flashed before your my eyes. He's, you're like, how did I look? He's like, oh. yeah. he's like, you were fucking, I had to, I had to ask to like lighten the mood, but yeah. yeah. I was in the... But no, no, the, the thing is for me, is like, I, I've never been able to do the faith thing. I've never quite been able to get there and I'm a bit cynical, but that doesn't necessarily make me happy. And, and I look at people who truly can but turn their brain off to the extent that what's in front of them, they can believe shit that's, that cannot be fucking proven and how happy it makes them and that deep sense of comfort that they must feel. And, and that is Nandor. That, that, that is what it's about. It's about what I sort of, the, the logic leap that I took with Nandor is he, and a lot of it's true. And it's based on some of the stuff that really happened in Nandor's life. When he was young, he had an encounter with a medium named William Carthauser. And Nandor, Nandor was very depressed after the loss of his father. And he went to a medium 
to try to encounter his dead father. And he realized that it was bullshit, right? And it, it deeply impacted him, though, because he wanted to believe. He wanted it to be true. So I created Nandor as this character who is searching for the case that's going to mystify him. It's, he's searching for the case that's going to... It's similar to what happened with Harry Houdini toward the end of his life in, in a different way. I don't know how... And I actually... There's this, like, sort of five-minute, like sort of divergence in Nandor in my film about Harry Houdini, where, where he talks about the end of his life and an mm -hmm. aspect of the end of his life that is a parallel to what I wrote about Nandor. But it's, you know, basically it's a guy who's searching for the case that's going to, he, he's so cynical and, and Nandor was famous. He's a parapsychologist. The specialty of his sort of sub aspect of the paranormal research was that he didn't believe in the paranormal. He believed it was all based on delusion and all based on, you know, trauma and so he didn't know why Jonathan was seeing his dead grandmother. He wanted to understand what trauma you had suffered to make you see your dead grandmother, right? But but I added the additional layer to him of like, but he want he, in the end he really wants that like case where he can look it in the eye and go, oh my god, okay, there is something else, and and truly fucking you know give him even just a a little string that he can pull on to start believing. And so that's what and. And to be fair, this case with Jeff has elements that are just inexplicable. And most of them are the human elements. Like, why? Like, these fucking people went to their graves saying Jeff was real. He wasn't fucking real. It was a farce. I mean, if you look at all fucking of the wonders, people, right? it's bullshit. But they fucking, Voire, the daughter, I mean, she went to her grave saying, and there was no financial incentive. They, you know, like, obviously, the, the sort of where I end up in the film is kind of like, okay, like, what is, what are people going to be remembered for? You know, like, I think that they probably kept it going for the sake of fame it for what it was worth. And it could have been that, but even that was strange because he was successful and they were simple people. They didn't, they weren't the type who would do this. But when you suffer a loss as Nandor did early in his life and in, 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 I mean, it, it can do two things. It can make you a cynic and then it can also make you seek justification for this horrid thing that happened to you on the on on the on the flip of a dime. You know what I mean? Like yeah. ultimately, I'm like you. I'm cynical. I think we're all like evolved parasites mm -hmm. floating around, like stuck to like <laughs> this molten rock in vacuum. And it's like okay, mm -hmm. like somehow these parasites on this molten rock evolved in vacuum. We're like okay, uh, yeah. but but when my brother. Well, Geeks Cavus, you all know this. Adam may not know this, but but in in 1986, when my with the night my brother was hit by a drunk driver, I remember walking the 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 neighborhood in the middle of the night and and looking up and seeing a, a shooting star. It, it, the things that people make themselves believe. Yeah. Did, did I see a fucking shooting star? I don't know I, if I saw a shooting star. The things yeah. I've made myself believe over the years, and the things that people need to believe, is that not the ultimate like? justification yeah. for the existence of faith oh, maybe not the, maybe not the reality no John, there's no reality but faith this no, is a movie about faith literally the first line of nandor is a title card that is an actual quote from the real nandor that says the fear of death begins at birth right now for me i think all religion is based on the fact that everyone's terrified of fucking death and they're look and death is the last unanswered question science it's not is economics it's not a, it's not a, it's a, it's a control mechanism based on like science has solved yeah. everything except right. death. like let's be real and and you know not to take the interview in a it, well, or a, except acceptance i think death is an exercise in acceptance i don't know like i think science is pretty much wrapped up I in death i agree with you i i do agree with you on that perspective and there's a strange comfort to be found in that but that's a much more philosophical thing but, you know, not, <laughs> not to take it in a super dark direction but pertaining to what you said about your brother and i'm so sorry about that if you want to hear something really fucked up uh, <clears throat> my so my girlfriend my my partner for about two and a half years we made chariot together. She was my my life partner. We lived together. She was also my producer. Partner. She passed away at the beginning of last year. She actually she actually passed away the day before I flew out to meet Simon for the first time. Wait, she, she, what? She, yeah, she she died pretty suddenly, and so I flew the next day. We had just signed Simon on, and I flew the the day after she passed. I flew out from where she was to to L.A. to meet with Simon. 
She died suddenly, though, and she was when she wasn't sick. She died in an yeah, accident. She, no, she got cancer. She had uh, stage four pancreatic cancer, but it was she passed. It, it the whole process was about a, about two months from no, being no, no, healthy no. and like straight up like we were roller skating together, and then two months later she was dead. I mean, it was it was like un, it, it was horrific beyond all reckoning. But I. I went the other direction from you with the shooting star thing. And, uh, you know, a lot of people and stuff would say, you know, she's with you and she can still, and I she couldn't feel it. I, I wanted to, and I wanted to believe that. And I want to believe that in some capacity she's around and whatever, but I just, something deep in me just wouldn't let me believe it. That was your immediate response. But in the years since and making this movie. Yeah. What were the, cause, cause I'm, cause I'm like you, I'm like the immediate sense. I'm like, well, this is a kick in the pain. You know what I mean? Like this sucks. And this is an actual, you know what I mean? And, and yeah. I've described, I don't know if you've been through divorce, but divorce is like, mm -hmm. yeah. So like you and I are, so if we talk, we can talk about all this stuff. You guys are like, well, I want to make a shot. I want to learn about filmmaking. How do yeah. you make your shots? <laughs> that, no, Geeks yeah. Davis, I have literally 18 years of podcasts where I've talked to filmmakers. Not that Adam isn't worthy <laughs> of collecting filmmaking, but this podcast, go back in the Geekscape and find out how to make an effing shot list. There you go. So listen, the divorce I have described as harder than, God, this sounds horrible. I'm so sorry if my parents listen to this. It was, it was harder for me to deal with the gray area of a divorce than the absolute of a death. Because, like you, I accepted the death as an absolute. But in the years, the 20 plus years since the death, and maybe in the last three years since the death, there are these weird signs. Yeah. There are these signs, Adam. That's and great. I'm like you. Like, but no, but have, you, have you seen the signs? I, that's, these, they speak to you. No, that's beautiful, man. And I, and I, and I like I said, my, my belief system is that there is more than this. But I don't know what it is. That 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 is that is some fooling up. ourselves. Is that enough for us? Is that like I like we're just fooling ourselves? Because that's a maybe to your story but too. I, no, but uh, that part and that can be good enough. I'm okay with that being good enough. Yeah, and what's crazy, and also too, man, I'll tell you, like, you know, losing a partner is is uh, quite an. It's it is for me. It's the second worst thing that can possibly happen. And I have kids, and you can guess what the first is, which I won't even say out loud. Mm -hmm. But losing your partner is a uniquely fucked up thing. Because that's your that's where you go, you know. Like that's, your that's like you, you you lose a parent, you lose a, a sibling, you lose, you lose a dog. Like those things are all fucked up. There's no question. But your partner is the one that comforts you. You know, and those are and, aspirations, those are dreams, those are plans for the future that you have to put in the ground. Is, it's it's so it is. Uh, you know, and and I jumped straight from her death into Nandor. I mean, straight up. Like I met with Simon about a month later, went to England and shot this movie and was just like, you know, tried to lose myself in the, in the insanity of film and which I did. And it helped me to process it. Cause you know, I, I realized with tragedy, there's no, there's no comfort other than distraction when it's it that may be the best thing. I remember a month after separation, going to Brazil and shooting cowboy heart yeah. and being yeah. so grateful that I was in a, another country Yeah, where People in another language weren't going to be like, so how are you? They didn't know me from effing Adam. Yeah. Hey, Adam, different Adam. But they didn't know me, yeah. and I wasn't going to be on the streets of freaking, like, you know, Sao Paulo with people going, oh, I heard what happened. I heard <laughs> you. Guys. Like, and, and so, but but when you came home, Adam, you rough, this movie and you came home, dude. That was a rough, that was a rough, strange homecoming with coming home to the house full of all of her shit, and, and it was like, so that was right. weird. That, that, and she had, she was the first person I, I wrote Nandor while filming Chariot while she slept with her head in my lap because we were together during Chariot. And so she, she read Nandor as it was being written. She loved it so much. And she, and you know, it, what was really fucked up too, when we were casting Nandor, so she had already passed away at this point, she yeah. was the biggest mini driver fan. She was su like, it, she was a, such a huge fan of gross point blank. And like, so when, when, when Minnie came about, because Simon was the first person we cast, and then yeah. we kind of started putting pieces to, around beside him, and somebody mentioned Minnie. I was like, yes, that's it. Yeah. So, yeah. It's one of the songs. <laughs> it was a song. All right, fine. I think. Right. I believe. Uh, I, I, you know what? I can't wait to see the movie, Adam. Like, yeah. like you and I have known each other a little bit just oh, through like social media and talking and da 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 da. <laughs> we, we only recently exchanged cell phones and this and that, but, but this is. I it's sorry, Geekscapists. We're looking for a film education, but um, 
again, like there's a lot of podcasts in this feed that have. Yeah, a lot sorry, of I went off topic. And, but, talk. but 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 I value these conversations more because they are what the films are about, and they are what our storytelling is about, and they are what inherently, they are what led you to pick up a book and a pen and a. They are what you are doing, and it goes back to that idea that when people are like, oh, you work in make-believe. And, and what I love about you specifically, Adam, is win or fail, right? Like whatever anybody thinks of your work. And I've not seen enough to say win or fail. But you go, at, you go, you go out and you want to hit it to a different part of the park every time. And somebody was asking me, we were, we were discussing a pretty major filmmaker who's like tons of people went to see their the film and I just cannot bring myself to see their film because it feels like the other films and and that, that is to, I and I can't I'll still watch all the freaking superhero stuff but that's for Geekscape. Game uh, but but I can't keep watching the filmmaker make the same tonal film over and over again but someone like a Danny Boyle yeah. who was like oh. You are actually trying to make a different movie every time when you have somebody like an Ang Lee who is like, yeah, I'll make a superhero movie. Yeah. You know, I'll make a Woodstock movie and I'll make a, I'll make my own Kung Fu movie and I'll do um, my own. Like you are actually trying to hit it to a different part of the park, regardless yeah. of whether or not you found your lane. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you know what I mean? Cause filmmakers can do that thing where they find what they do really well and just be like, yeah, I'll push that button to get the monkey treat every time. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, honestly, like I, it's always just been deeply rooted in my DNA to, to try to be original. And, and it's because I, it's just what, what invigorates me. It, like I, I listen, I love great movies and a great movie is a great movie, whether it's original or not the Godfather, like, is it original? No, but it's a perfect movie and I love it, but I'm so much more tolerant. I'm so much more intrigued. I'm so much more drawn to something that I haven't seen before. And so with my films, yeah, I do, man. I try, I try to do something different. And I was the other night I went and saw, I went and saw the old boy uh, re-release out in the theater. Yeah, yeah that's and the movie. It's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> and, and the trailers were all just like, thriller and like you know that and, and i was just sitting there like oh god i just made a movie about a talking mongoose like you know okay well <laughs> here we go i guess because it's just like i i just can't there, i know that there's things that people want me to make i know there's the what the industry wants i know what is out there i've taken such a more difficult path and i just it couldn't stomach doing the same thing i, I just can't like i don't know what did you the, the one I'm fascinated about and I'm gonna be straight up with you is the one I'm like fascinated about is when the uh, starlight ends. Yeah. And, and, and I'm fascinated by those first two movies don't don't be smart your work don't do that don't no, do I'll that. Tell you no listen but, but, but that and stakeout I kind of am fascinated by the autobiographical stuff yeah. because you kind of have to pop that pimple I know when you first start out and even if it feels not like I don't want uh, the words kind of masturbatory, but even if it feels sort of like that, there's a little bit more of like, feck it. If Richard Linklater, another person who's doing different movies every time, if Richard Linklater, yeah. if it's good enough for Richard Linklater to do a movie about who he is and where he's from and what he's going through, then it's good enough for us. And you didn't just tell the story within the Starlight Ends, right. you told it in a revisionist way that might have prepped you for Chariot. Well, it prepped me for divorce. I'll tell you that much. Not it was a very no. personal story about like, about just realizing about myself that I'm almost a fucking sociopath when it comes to telling stories and how the art, the artistic aspect of my life is more important than everything else. And, and, and that I know I shouldn't feel that way. And I, and I love my family. I love my kids. I lo love my ex-wife, you know, I, I love them all, but, but, deep as deep as I run I'm here to tell stories and and that's what Starlight was about and it was me realizing that about myself and Starlight was a fucking catastrophe for a lot of reasons the biggest one being I didn't get to edit that movie the the, the uh, producers and investors actually just took it and made it into what they wanted to make it and I you know it, Sam and I talk about it often and and there's articles out there and stuff about what happened with that movie where you know essentially they just kind of they didn't want me, they, they wanted to fire me while we were making the movie. And Sam said, no, 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 no. I came on to do this movie with Adam. And so they were stuck with me and we didn't have money and we tried our best. And so then they, we finished and I did a cut 
and, I, and of the movie and I sent it to the producers and everything and they were like this is fantastic and Sam loved it he's like dude this is what we set out to make and so I sent it to the to the so so then the um, the investors said okay we're gonna do a round of of notes and I said oh, okay great and then I didn't hear anything again and then they were like hey we sold the movie and I was like what do you mean and they're like yeah hey, we just took our cut and sold it and I hadn't even seen it I hadn't had any participation and so I kind of was like you know, what the fuck is going on here? And it was financed by Dr. Oz and of all people, because his daughter was the lead in it. And so Oz and his brother-in-law and his wife cut the movie and made it. And, <laughs> and it was, it was a, it was a learning experience. And that's not an excuse for why the movie sucks. I actually think the movie has some great moments in it, but it was not what I intended. And, and I learned, and, and now I've had, I've had other bad experiences on movies for sure, but I always get final cut. That that's the one thing where I don't let that happen again because I was powerless. I was powerless, and I and I couldn't do anything. And it was really crazy having that feeling and put and putting in so much time and effort and emotion and belief, and then just having it taken away. I was like, oh yeah, I'm not gonna do that again. There are so many filmmakers who've been on the show who tell that story, yeah. and their career takes a pivot yeah like at that and in, in you for you it's i will make a movie for less money or a movie that's more traditional to yeah. to make sure i have that final cut is that what stakeout was because stakeout when you look at yeah. stakeout on the level it's like stakeout it was, stakeout feels a little less adam it was it was much more linear and and you know the the synthesis of why i made stakeout and it was called fucking sargasso it was called sargasso it was such a better title and they fucked it but whatever they have I, stakeout movies they have really less of it as know, richard dreyfuss i know it was called sargasso it was such a better title but anyway i don't even think of it as stakeout it's sargasso so when i was a pi everybody would always kind of say like what is it like you know it's so exciting and i'd go to meetings in the film industry and they'd be like oh you got to write a script and i think they had this vision of me as fucking nightcrawler running around but it was boring and it was depressing and it was seeing poor mexican people getting fucked by the insurance system in la and then seeing the hypocrisy of then small business owners getting fucked by what's going on and, and it was just this kind of like morass of just depressive shit in la and I was like, okay, you guys really want me to write a script about this? Okay, fine. And I, I would tell my surveillance partner, I, when, when I've seen everything as a PI, at that point, when I've seen everything there is to see, I'm done, I'm retiring, I'm just going to go into movies full time, I don't give a fuck if I can't support my family, I'll figure out a way. And I reached that point where I'd seen everything with this one case. And I made that movie. And I'm proud of, of Sargasso. That movie is like... That the, the two lead characters represented the two sides of me, which was the young sort of like starry eyed guy who was like, OK, I'm doing doing the right thing. I'm out there investigating. I'm solving crimes. And then the older sort of dawning awareness of like the fact that nobody fucking wins and that when I'm a good P.I. and I do a good job and fucking Pablo or Jose who works at a factory and is trying to fucking feed his family and is maybe making some questionable decisions about workers comp and I bust him. It's like, cool. The insurance company's happy with me and their stock, you know, like fine. But, but this guy's fucking life is ruined. And I was like, you know, this is a broken system and it's nobody's winning from any of this. And that's what I wrote about. And so that's what Sargasso was. And, and so I'm proud of it from the perspective that if people watch it and can get over the fact that it's a low budget movie, like it, it, it actually has a fucking message that I stand behind and that turned out pretty strong. And you never felt the pressure to be like, hey, man, make it training day. I, of course, but I don't yeah. give a fuck. You know me. like, like Right. I, what I, did I, you do? Like, did you give up money on the budget to make sure it did not turn into training day? <laughs> no, I had to. I mean, budgetarily, that movie was an absolute nightmare. I, I hooked up with these producers who were like, we're financing this movie. And I said, OK, well, plot twist, they were not financing anything. And I was actually raising okay. money i was raising money as we shot so i was filming and then fundraising while filming to 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 get us to the finish line because nobody else was doing did it. you shoot the movie in spurts production spurts no we shot the whole thing it was just kind of like i wasn't sleeping much I, that was when i was going through a divorce. Shit is on debt yeah so it was uh I, that one was kind of like kept afloat by sheer force of my will yeah 
We are yeah. showing up with cameras tomorrow, and we are shooting there. Yeah, pretty much. And we are pointing the camera at actors, regardless yeah, and of. And it was like, well, we have no money, and I was like, don't worry, we will by tomorrow, and we did. You got yourself an <laughs> ulcer. I mean, you must have been a goddamn rage cage at yeah. that point, going through a divorce and fighting for the life of a film because yeah. it was your. I mean, I don't, we're not going to say it was your last chance, but it was kind of like after the experience you had of having Dr. Oz take your movie away yeah. and give it a facelift like it gives somebody else. <laughs> like, it, 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 it jibs back in the comments. He says, Adam, I was already glad when Dr. Oz didn't win his uh, Senate race. Your story helps further justify my schadenfreude. Uh, <laughs> I agree. For the sake of, he's a very famous, powerful man. I, I, not a big fan of that guy. Let's put it that way. So yeah, but when we here's what we want to talk about. What we want to talk about is the fact that uh, Nander Fordor. I don't know how you can see it. Like Legion, like you would see it on a VOD, right? Oh no, it's doing theatrical. It's in theaters. It's it's doing theatrical. But like you're gonna end up seeing it. Like however you want to see it, Geekscapers, you got to check the local listings. Yeah. Uh, Nander Fordor. You're gonna see Seven Pegs in it. Christopher Lloyd, Mini Driver, my friend Ruth O'Connell. Is in the movie. Ruthie. Uh, Ruthie. Was, I had a birthday party the other night. She's here and she's pregnant. I have not seen Ruthie since. Huh. I, wonder, I, have, I, I last saw Ruthie a few years ago. I talked to her last summer. Uh, but Ruthie and I met when I was understudying on Supernatural. I was understudying Bob Singer on Supernatural. And Ruthie yeah. and I just kind of hung out the whole time yeah. um, with Emily Swallow, who you can now see on Mandalorian and all that stuff. But um, yeah. One I of love her. Congratulations I to Ruthie. I know. One of my favorite humans. She's absolutely lovely, and I love her so much. And That's the word I was going to use to describe her. was she lovely. She is. And also, yeah. you mentioned the voice of Jeff in Nandor. Is Neil fucking Gaiman, dude. Uh, like, What kind of nerdgasm did you have when that happened? Dude, it was so crazy how that came about. And so once he agreed to do it, and I exchanged a couple emails with him, his assistant said, okay, you can come record this stuff with Neil. Come up to upstate New York. He likes to do it at this this converted church that's now a recording studio it's in the middle of fucking nowhere i said okay and so i flew out to new york immediately and drove two and a half hours in the middle of the night out to woodstock and the, the then further into the middle of nowhere early the next morning to this recording studio and there neil shows up and we chatted for about an hour before we started and he was just absolutely such a kind nice guy we had a lot of stories about his books and and people we knew and mutual friends and 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 he was just so fucking cool and I fucking cry dude i know it was beautiful he was, but he's so unassuming like like he, like he's just a dude he showed up and he was just kind of in his fucking car and was like hey man and came in and we just chatted and we talked a lot about miyazaki and because you know we forgot you know what what i forgotten so simon is the the a huge Miyazaki fan. I'm a big Miyazaki fan. And you know, obviously Princess Mononoke is one of the few movies that I watched dubbed, you know, for one of the and, few anime that I watched. And dubbed. Neil wrote the... Yeah, he yeah. said, he, he and he got taken off the credits by Harvey Weinstein. It, which is fucked, but Geekscape is, Mononoke was seen as an inaccessible film to Western audiences, so uh -huh. Neil wrote an extra portion of yeah. the movie to yeah. make it more accessible, and I think that that portion is awesome. So that was like a big part of the, for me, that was a big part of the advertising. When Princess Mononoke came out in theaters, Neil Gaiman's involvement was one of the major points. That and the fact that it was the director of Nausicaa and Lapida, which was like, my big selling point was like, Lapida is my favorite of the Miyazaki films. It's beautiful. And that, that's that. And I, I've been, I mean, I don't know. I talk about one, Miyazaki all the fucking time. On, one day on set, you know, Simon came to me and he said, dude, you remember who did the voice of Lady Eboshi? And I said, no, fucking Mini Driver. And I was like, holy shit, I forgot that. And then I was like, actually, like with Mini, I was like, oh my God, that's fucking amazing. And I said- but That's because you're watching the Japanese subtitles. Yeah, no, 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 the, yeah. the, the, the dubbed one. Yeah, the one yeah. with the famous actors. Uh, oh, I watched that one though. The, the, American dub, the American dub of that is really good. It's one of the few movies, again, that I'll watch dubbed. Hmm. Usually I'll watch subbed. Uh, I, I watch a ton of anime and I'll always yeah. watch it. But if you watch Lapida, you're gonna end up with James. D no offense, James Vanderbeek, but you're gonna end up with James Vanderbeek. The uh, one to watch the dub version of the Miyazaki is Porco Rosso because it's fucking Michael Keaton. I know, but and no, but, like, yeah. fucking, but the dub of of Mononoke is amazing. It's like Claire Danes and Billy Bob Thornton and you're me right. and fucking Minnie. I mean, it's dope. Like that that dub is worth watching, and I've seen it both ways. But but 
on the the dub, which is by far the more popular version of that particular movie, it's Minnie, and I, and I forgot that, and I talked to her about it, and it was fucking amazing. So. And so, Geekscape, I bring up and I push on this Nander Fordor thing because we need Adam to pop, so we can go back, and his name can be the commercial aspect of going back and getting his earlier two films. Well, the second movie is the the, the movie. That's the budget that they ended up with, but. That first movie, we gotta go back and rescue it. We gotta go back and, uh, I mean, is 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 revisionism and in, in in justification? I don't need to. You know, the question is: is the is revisionism justification and the refolding of our existence a running theme in this stuff? When you have something like your first film, when you have something like the gray area that you're learning in the second movie and the third movie is absolutely about revisionism and about that. And then this fourth movie is about the justification of faith and the lies we tell ourselves and truly what is the gray area again? Like, is that all kind of your, your theme? And I, and I talk about you trying to hit the ball to the other part, parts of the, of the field every time, but it all kind of plays within that ballpark. No. Yeah, absolutely. My art dictates my life in a lot of ways. Like it really does my life does dictate my art to an extent, but my, my life seems to follow my movies in a lot of ways. And, and the stories I tell often manifest themselves in my life in very strange ways, like even Sargasso in some ways. It's very odd. But you've got this movie about death chariot and you were with your partner making it. And then that happens. Yeah. It's a fuck that's mean. Like that is that is a mean I'm uh, sure I'm careful cosmic now. trick. I'm was more careful. Right? <laughs> I'm more careful what? now, you know, with what I write. Because no, it was yeah, it was crazy, man. The Tower, this movie that you made uh this summer while we were at Comic Con having fun and you were stressed out thinking you were gonna not be able to finish your movie. Yeah, we got shut yeah. down for one day. I saw Claire the, the next day, day or two later. I walk into Comic Con. I'm like, "Hey, Claire! I've been reading Adam's uh, oh, Instagram, and uh, I'm pretty sure I knew what happened because it's happened a few times. And yeah. getting getting a SAG uh, waiver was kind of fresh within days of you getting yeah. it, and actually within hours. Like you guys got shut down until that shit was getting faxed over. Like y'all literally had to sit there until the thing showed up in an email. We were the third movie. Yeah, I mean, it was actually wild because what happened to us was. When we, we knew SAG were going to go on strike going into yes. production, but, but they were like, no, what's going to happen is we'll go on strike. You guys are fine because this is independently financed by, you know, private investors and then you'll get your waiver. And so we're like, okay, great. Here was the one fucking problem was SAG doesn't work weekends. We were shooting our days off were Monday and Tuesday. Mm. So SAG went on strike on a Thursday. And on Friday, we were like, okay, we need our waiver. And they're like, oh, no, no, the waiver is not even created yet. And we're like, okay, so what do we do? Because we're shooting. And they're like, oh, that's fine. Just by Monday, you'll have it. I'm like, well, sorry to be uh, difficult, but we're shooting Saturday and Sunday. And they're like, no, 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 you just can't shoot Saturday and Sunday. And I was like. We so don't have wiggle room. We are a small <laughs> production. Like like just work. Um, yeah. So the next day, Saturday, we came to set and everybody was there. The actors were there. And I said, okay, so uh, we're not supposed to shoot today. And so I shot a lot of B-roll. <laughs> I shot a lot of shots of trees. How many people, how many people in that unit? Two people, yeah, three people in the unit? And, and so basically I shot a lot of trees and trains and houses and fucking dead roadkill. Do you and usually shoot that stuff on your films? Do you shoot a lot of the B? No, not as people? much as, not as much as I'd like to, but on right. that one, no choice. So it was good. So meanwhile, and then intermittently just hammering our SAG rep saying, listen, I'm on board with the strike. I support everything, but this is not, this is the type of film you don't want to hurt. Like we're, we're doing this the right way. So when can we get this? And this was a Saturday and it was no response, no response, no response. And I'm just like freaking out. And then Saturday night at 1030, we got an email from SAG saying this will serve as your interim waiver. They didn't even have the interim waiver yet, but they, but they said, we, the interim waiver is coming. You are approved. This serves as notification. They emailed the reps of our actors. I was like, oh, God, thank God. So then we only missed one day. We only missed that Saturday. And Sunday we were back to it. And they were allowed to come to set suddenly. And they were allowed to come back. It was, uh, but it was, yeah, it was crazy. 
You guys built a pretty big set piece for that movie. Yeah, we built a fucking huge water tank. That's the thing about me too, is that like, I know that I'll come to a point in my career at some point where I'm super comfortable with like filming green screen and all kinds of VFX and shit, but I'm not there yet. And so I'm very simple and practical. And so they were like, okay, like we'll get a pool. And, put, and it, it's about a mermaid who's in a water tower, right? So I filmed the outside of the water tower. I'm like, no, no, no. Like, we need to build the inside of water tower. They're like, what if you do it with cables and air and slow mo? And then, like, that's what they did with Spike Kids. And it's like, no, 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 no. We're right budget. I'm sure it works, but but my experience, literally without exception, is that every time producers or fucking whoever are like, oh no, so here's what, like some fucking jury rigged way to do it, it looks like shit. And so I, I was like, oh, let's build a fucking tank. And we built a gigantic water tank with like 30,000 gallons of water in it. And we made it into the inside water tower. I, I talked about a sequence in the film where we're working on now with, with driving. And it's like, oh, but you, there's so much you can shoot on a volume. And I'm like, I do not want to shoot driving on a volume. I don't want to do it. I don't Just want to shoot driving on a volume. And there's a part of you. And I understand the volume because you're shooting and like, I, I, my I'm like you when it comes to VFX and post and that stuff because I want to go home and have the footage and know in a couple snips that yes. I have what I wanted and I have the movie and that that yeah. but if you are looking for play but if you're shooting plates and that stuff needs to be composited and you need to start putting this stuff together it, it, I don't want to live with that kind of nerve wrack that no. like holy shit like do no. I actually have this do I have this sequence no, no, did no. this did no. I do this and like the volume stuff sounds great, and I love the idea. I love what volume is doing to like the volume stages are doing to like your AD loves it because you can like snap a finger and you're in a new location. You just have to add like the pool table. But the but the but for somebody who thinks that film is should, in performances should still be tactile, should still be people putting their fingers on things, I know. people breathing within their same areas. Like you gotta, there's nothing like the real thing, baby. I know. And so you're building a damn pool so you can go home at night and you can look at the dailies. Yeah. And you can fucking make sure you have your damn movie, especially because wow. you lost a day. Well, and it, and it, yeah. And it, it, like you said, you nailed it. It's the actors, you know, acting's hard and it's hard. It's already hard. And trying to make actors act with nothing is impossible. And, I, and so I want it to be real. And, and, and it's always like, and I also just love, practical effects in general like i look at them and i just am so much and, and look i'm not such a, some fucking purist douchebag i mean i'm a douchebag but i'm not a purist no like, but it, it's an augmentation to what you're trying to do practically. Yes. And, if, is, and if there's no way to do it practically you fucking do it with vfx but try and do it some aspect of it practically and i just think it helps the actors it helps everything i was watching that mission impossible last night and trying to see when they're doing like the yeah. Actors, did you see the new Mission Impossible thing? I did. Your, buddy, your buddy Simon's in it. I, did. Um, I was trying to look for like the Texas switches between mm. actors and stuff, yeah. and I was like, how they do the Texas switch? And, and ultimately, a part of me is like, or did they just do face replacements? Or did they just do? But it would be so much cooler with Texas switches, where, I mean, where there's one actor on screen, and then Geeks gave us a combination of the blocking performance and lighting and camera an actor swaps in for another actor. And obviously in a Mission Impossible movie where people are undergoing different identities and secret masks and things mm -hmm. like that, you can see why you would need a Texas switch with one actor stepping in and suddenly undergoing the identity of another actor character in the movie. Yeah. And like, that's what I was looking for in the movies whenever it like pans and this and that. I love those things. I know, it would have been so cool. Yeah, I think they actually did it in a few places and they used a oh, wig yeah. on the a wig on the edge of frame oh, wow. to have an actor step into the wig, an actor wearing the wig. That'd be cool. Simon specifically is holding the wig. Ah. And oh, yeah, the, the, the wig is the edge of frame. Yeah. And then yeah. and then when the camera pans back around, it's the different actor's face in that wig. I think they use yeah. the wig to make the Texas switch. But yeah. Simon Simon had to hold the wig exact oh, without wow. without moving it when the actors swapped That's to cool. do it. And it was very, it was very quick. I think there was a Texas switch right there. That being said, Everyone's telling you, like, uh, that being said, they shot it during the pandemic, and there were scenes where you could tell because of the way that they shot the separation. Yeah. And where I, and where you could see some of the stuff where I was like, the, I love it. This movie is cool. It's got some great set pieces. It's exciting. I want to feel something a little bit more organic. 
in some I of this mean, stuff. Simon's told, I talked a lot to Simon and I hung out a whole bunch making Nandor and he told me all a lot about how they make those movies and it's so wild. I mean, it's just another level of filmmaking that I'm so far from. I mean, like they don't even have scripts for a lot of that stuff. It's built around the action pieces and there's mm -hmm. a lot of improv. And I just looked at Simon one day when he was, and I said, this sounds so fucking stressful. And he kind of looked at me and just went like, and That's Simon <laughs> I'm in such a literate, such a script guy. And so, he's the sweetest person we've ever had on Geek's Cape. He's, so I'll tell you. He's uh, the sweetest person we've ever had on Geek's Cape. But the story that reminds me of is the Jeff Daniels on Iron Man 1 story, where he so, showed up on set on Iron Man. The first day of Jeff Daniels on Iron Man 1, he shows up with Robert Downey Jr. and Jeff Favreau, John Favreau, just doing the, like, the improv thing. And Jeff Daniels is like, So this is what you're fucking, this is what you're doing? Like you're just improving a big movie like this? Okay. Uh, all right, all right. I guess I guess I'm on the ride. Yeah, that's amazing, Simon. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a brief anecdote about Simon. So I told you that that you know we were closing Simon, and and he, I had had a Zoom with him, and he's like, I want to do this movie, and I said, okay, cool, and I was like, great, and I was so kind of just like starstruck and excited to be working with this actor that I respected so much, and I, you know, again, my my partner passed away, and. The next day I flew out to LA to meet Simon because he was only going to be here for one day. And I was like, I got to meet this guy in person. So I flew out and I was a wreck on the flight. And, but I, on the flight, I was like, you know what? Like nervousness and grief. You no, know, just, just, yeah. Just, I was just, I was fucking just broken. But I was like, rage cage, Adam. I'm calling you the rage cage. This wasn't rage. This was just sad. I know. Sad. Just but I said, I said, I'm not going to make this this meeting about that. This is about Nandor. I want this to be positive and dope and exciting. And this is what this is, right? So I sat down with Simon at the hotel out here in Beverly Hills and it was so great. And we hung out and chatted and we chatted for like two hours. And, but at one point he kind of looked at me and, and we were just talking about Nandor and he said, mate, I saw on your Instagram, like, did your, did your girlfriend just die? And I said, yeah, 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 but dude, I'm good, man. Nandor is going to be dope. I'm excited to make this fucking movie. And he kind of looked at me like, okay. So then he got my number somehow because we'd only been dealing through the reps. And he texted me the next day and he said, dude, he said, I've just been thinking about you all day. And he's like, you must be so fucking sad. And he's like, I'm going to do an extra amazing job on this movie in her honor. And like, dude, this is a famous actor. Like this is a movie star saying that to essentially a new director. But he didn't have to do that. Like he had the fucking part. We were kissing his ass to be in my movie. He had no measure of kissing up to me that he needed to do. So, so like that speaks to his character. Like that's a real dude right there. Like straight up, like he didn't have to do that. He did this thing. Oh, I'll go ahead and say it. I don't know if he has the same reps, but with the idea of quid pro quo and a doc, he was in our documentary, Doc of the Dead, and he oh, shot all he shot all the stuff in, in our in our living room, and he in he always between doing Geekscape and then coming back for, for Dark of the Dead, he knew the names of our dogs and everything. and Just a real person. And yes. uh, and we got an email in be in like the month or a couple months be between him being at the house for Geekscape and then being back at the house for the shooting of the documentary where like the day before he was supposed to come over and film the documentary, some rep sent me an email. Did not, suddenly, Simon's not CC'd on any of these. And the only one he wasn't CC'd on was one was like, so what's the quid pro quo on this? And it's a documentary. Like, we cannot pay people in a documentary. Yeah. You point a camera. Yeah, like, and I felt so effing awkward. I was mm -hmm. like, I quid pro quo on a documentary. Like, I we can't pay. It's yeah. a dark. And so, and I forwarded, I kind of like sent a message to Simon. It was like, dude, I just got this message. Like, I don't know how to deal with it. I'm so sorry, dude. Like, I really am excited to have you over and shoot this thing. And he goes, give me five minutes. And he says, taken care of. See you tomorrow. And I was like, you're a real one. And there's a chapter, Geekscapists who've not picked up his book, Nerd Do Well. There's a chapter in his book that talks about both Star Wars and losing a childhood friend. That when I read it, I was sitting in a effing Carl's Jr., reading this damn book and I sent him a message that I was crying. <laughs> I don't know. I was eating junk food, just crying and reading this chapter. And if you've not read nerd to well, go pick up that book and read that yeah. because that, that specific chapter tells you everything what, you need yeah. to know about him as a fan and as a human. And I'll tell you this as a professional. I mean, when you people, I think although a lot of aspiring actors that I know, I think they have this mentality of like, they see an actor who's famous and, and they're like, why, why him? Like, I could do that. I could do that better than him. Let me tell you something about Simon Pegg. He's fucking perfect. He's so fucking good. 
every decision this guy made was right. Every script tweak he wanted to make was better than what I had written. He does, he does the whole movie in a Hungarian accent. And I was so nervous because I had had a bad experience on a different movie with an actor trying to do an accent. And he shows up at the table read and it's fucking flawless. Simon is so smart and so good. He's next level smart and good. Something Simon did while we were filming Nandor that didn't hit me until months later. Every day I'd show up on set and he would be like, mate, that fucking scene yesterday, that note you gave me was so good. He'd be like, dude, you got it. He was like, I've worked with a lot of great directors and you have it. It could have all been bullshit, but he hyped me up so much that my confidence was so high that I did a better job as a director that he was in. You need that momentum. Not to escape us. How many days? How many days? How many days? We shot for like twenty five days. It was a, it was a, it was a crazy shoot. But and you need the momentum, or you're going to go fucking nuts, and you're going to have dips. Yeah, but that's the point. Like he could have gone home and been yeah. like, "This guy's a complete fucking idiot." But he uh, he had me so confident, and and not a lot of actors do that. But it speaks to just the fact that the dude knows what he's doing. He's so cool. Everybody on set fucking loved him. And I can tell you a crazy story, crazy, like unbelievably crazy about like just his help with regard to post and the release of the film and stuff like that. That's like, I'm, I'm like not even sure if I can actually tell it. Maybe I'll tell it to you off, but it's, it's like mind blowing how much he did for this film. And like the guy really is a rarity. You know, and I've gotten lucky, I think, with a lot of the actors I've worked with. I've become really good friends with Malkovich. Like, Sam from Starlight is, like, I mean, the guy just went to he's, that. He's in Outlander, yeah, which I don't watch, but I but Heidi watches it. And I used to call it, I, I was like, oh, whenever I'd walk through the room, porn. I'd always see him kind of naked. I know. And I'd be like, oh, you're watching your time travel porn. So, like, yeah. in, in our household, it's not called Outlander. It's called time travel porn. And, and yeah. she's like, Jonathan, it hasn't been time travel porn for several seasons. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm now so it's, sorry. Yeah, now it's just period piece porn. But yeah. Sam is a Sam is a, a lovely guy. Well, that, that story about him, I read a story about him when the financiers, those ones who seemed incredibly kind to you and, and patient and wonderful, uh, when they wanted to cut his budget by 80% and it would have negated most actors' come. involvement. They made me do it. They made, they made they me wanted come. you to, to deliver the good news. I called, him, I called him trying not to cry, and I said, hey, this was two weeks before. This that, was is a a, that is a movie killer in 99.9% .9 of the situations. No, I in any that. movie, that's a movie killer. I drove to the top of a hill because I was just so upset, and I would just you might as well throw yourself thing. off if it goes yeah, bad. Yeah, and I called and I called Sam, and I said, "Hey, dude, you know I have some bad news. We're not going to make the movie." And he said, "What do you mean?" And I said, "They are deferring essentially all your pay. Like you're gonna, you're, you're not even getting paid enough to cover your flight." And he kind of was quiet, and he said, oh, "It's fine. I'm, like, yeah, I'm still doing it." I said, "What do you mean?" And he's like, no, "I'm doing this for you, man." He's like, "I, I love this script. I love you." I don't need this fucking money. Like, let's do it. And I was so shocked that he was doing. Like, I was just like, "Are you kidding me, dude?" And he's like, "Yeah, it's fine. Uh, we're, I'm in." And I was like, "Again, like, I've gotten lucky with regard to the, the the caliber of most of the people that I've worked with on the acting side, and and just like, you know, Simon was just the latest in that. Yeah. You know, just like a true fucking, and also just like such a cinephile. We had movie night many a couple times during Nandor, and just we we both just have such a reverence for film you know well adam listen i'm gonna see you at the premiere on thursday yeah i can't wait i'm coming to this premiere screening this thing yeah but thank you for the invite where i can't wait to see it this movie it's see. got many of my favorite things and now because you've been on geekscape you're one of them oh you, you know like what? this talk i'm sorry we didn't talk about too much film but we kind of still did if you think yeah. about geekscape us uh, hey you know, I, I talk about whatever you want, man. You ever want me on again after I make another movie? I'll talk just about film, but, you know. I don't I like love that. that. I mean, Geeks gave us, I love that stuff, but, like, they tell you, like, the real learning how to film is just be on set and go get a, get a camera and make your movies and stuff. Like, that's really the, that's where you learn it. Listening to a bunch of people talk about a Geekscape is really the why. And if I can deliver the why on Geekscape, that's, that, guys, I need Geekscape. I was talking to my father today. We were talking about, the hiccup and the strike and my producer and I having the like talking to actors and how do we get this next movie up? And, and my dad's like, and I, and I asked my dad just straight up, I said, dad, am I the definition of insanity? You know, just doing this thing over, you know, just doing it, doing it, doing it. 
And uh, and immediately what you do when you ask yourself that situation, it comes out of frustration, geekscapism, and impatience is you erase the progress you have made and you erase the wonderful moments and memories you have made. And if anything, geeks, and he's like, so this geeks, you know, my dad, I was always like checking on geekscape. He's like, so this geekscape thing, does it still serve you? Because it's the longest running thing. And I said, yeah, because I get to meet people who have the shared story like I do. Yeah. And we get to like, talk about the why and not a lot of places talk about the why yeah, i'm not sure sid field when you're learning to write a screenplay talks about the why and sid field's really great about the what a lot of these places are really good about the what yeah three point yeah go learn three-point lighting it's the why and it's great absolutely that's everything it's everything um adam i'll see you on thursday dude thanks so much for being on geeks came man love you dude all right yeah. Yeah. Thanks, brother. Nanda Fordor is going to be on uh, in theaters uh, coming up this week. Geeks gave us check your local listings, look for that movie, and go get tickets because we need this thing to be a hit so we can go back to Doctor Oz and be like, "Hey, this guy's a big name now. We need <laughs> we need to recut this movie." Have you seen this this Outlander thing? Oh, uh, God, uh, this, have you seen this Outlander thing? It's big, yeah. man. These two, we got some big names on this, and uh, yeah. I think this movie deserves a re-edit and a special edition. And, I'm down. Uh, Director's cut. I have the fucking director's cut. It's I know you. Video. I know you. I know you do. I know. You do. Every filmmaker is like, yeah, here's my edit. And then there's a hard drive on a shelf next to a Max figure. Yeah, that it's in the closet behind. I know. Them. I'm looking at. I have my. There's a Get Up Kids story about a director's cut that I have because Matt Pryor, who I love. Uh, it goes back to practical filmmaking. Matt Pryor did not want to do stuff that wasn't practical because he he didn't want to do anything with with uh, speed, variable frame like frame rates and speed stuff. And I needed to because I needed to shoot slow mo. And I had to convince Matt Pryor because they just did a Get Up Kids video that was not good. You can find it. I'm not going to do smirch a filmmaker, but you can find it. Geekscape is here's a Get Up Kids video. It's supposed to be one take. It's got speed problems. It's got wow. weird stutter problems. Wow. Matt showed up and was like, Jonathan, I don't want to do this in slow mo. And I said, We have do do this in slow mo and Matt Pryor, who I love, I had to convince to do it practically um, without any weird effects, and we got it done practically. But we took variable frame rates, and and uh, that's that's my convincing actors that if doing something weird and technical isn't going to mess up their organic process. Good for you, man. I love it. <sighs> Love you, man. Geeks Cabus will be here next week. Um, go watch Nando Fordor and uh, tell your friends to subscribe to this podcast. Hey, buddy. Um, Peace. All right. See ya.